This is Cow the Podcast. Yeah, hi there. This is Cow the Podcast, a dot online, and I'm Ann Biggs. I'll be your host for the next 20 or 30 minutes, taking you on a trip into that strange and wonderful landscape of this here podcast. Stay with me. If you just want to come by and say hello or make a comment, same place. Cow the Podcast online. Hi there. Last week, we took a look at the world of physics, quantum Bayesian mechanics, and the evolutionary tricks of the dual beetle, understanding where we're at in the battle between free will and determinism, and why the jury is still out this week, today, a look at why that battle is so important. Why such a long and hard battle? Breaking down the discussion, decide what we mean by it, where we might find it, and why we need it. Free will, what's in it for me? But before we do, if you're a regular listener and you're feeling generous, thinking maybe this podcast could use my support, well, you're right. You can go and find out how to go about doing just that at cowthepodcast.online. And thank you to those who are supporting us right now. Without you, we couldn't be doing this. So free will. Free will. What is it? Do we have it? Where do we get it? What's it for? The importance to humanity of the discussion of free will cannot be denied. The idea of free will has been argued about for thousands of years. The argument raging even now as to whether we live in a deterministic material world or live in a world of ideas rages amongst philosophers, physicists and theologians because there are consequences that flow from the answer about how we live, about how we behave in the world. These are consequences that depend on our relationship to and our understanding of free will. If my consciousness, my sense of self, is a byproduct of my brain's complexity, if it emerges from the material of a physical world, and that world obeys the physical definable laws of behaviour, then my mind must obey those laws too, must emerge from it. We should therefore be able to use the laws to predict what it will do, and in that case what I will do. My belief then in my own free will becomes nothing more than illusion. I might choose inverted commas, for example, to raise a cheer to my neighbour or two fingers even. I might choose to eat fish this evening or to enjoy a glass of wine or both. But ultimately, and let's stick with the grapes, the argument goes that they've been destined to be in that glass since they were picked. And the picker was destined to pick that grape since the day he or she was born. And the wool for the swaddling blanket that day had been destined to wrap that baby, warmed by an open fire from the day that fire was used to melt the iron from some pounded rock under the grey skies of a hilltop fort settlement. And the rain falls as little more than a mist that day, beginning a journey that will see it appear later in this journey. And I have no choice but to type these words and to read them out, or you, whether to hear them. That's determinism. And from this flows the thought that it's okay, everything's okay, there's nothing you can do about who you are, what you feel or what you'll be doing this evening. Don't worry about it. But of course there are problems with this, firstly in trying to explain how it is exactly that consciousness emerges from unconscious matter, and of course how this might explain God, or love, or the self-evident reality of conscious thought. Self-evident, you say? Well, you know, I think, therefore I am. And philosophically speaking, if we're to accept that the universe consists of a single set of rules, that it can all be explained as a single unity, as we would understand from the study of physics, then we must believe it a binary question with either one answer or another. Either consciousness emerges from matter or matter must emerge from consciousness. So could the world be nothing more than thought or at least something meta or other than physical? So are we individual consciousnesses? Are we small units of a shared consciousness? Do we create all of the rocks and stones and planets and stars out of our imagination as one imagination? How can we see the same things? We share our individual experiences. And how come I can't control the future if everything's just a figment of my imagination? So I've put the thought of free will into your head right there. But what do I mean by it? And what do you mean by it? Let's just roll this back a ways and make sure we're on the same starting page. Firstly, there are two kinds of free will. We see an undetermined, unfettered freedom, absolute freedom. 
And this is the philosophical freedom that exists in opposition to absolute determinism. This is where the battle lives, the battle between science and religion, between realism and idealism. But whilst this row goes on, we miss an opportunity to define different versions. To get to the point, we can deconstruct what it means to express absolute self-determinism and talk about the depth to which we can assume free will has its domain. If we want to talk about an absolute free will, then we must be prepared to believe that our world exists only for ourselves as individuals. And that reality is highly unlikely. Everything, including you and me, reality emerges from my consciousness. Any other view, however, must accept at least in part some degree of determinism, be it 1% or 99%. We can understand that to operate on a human scale, both free will and determined behaviour are both possible. Any other view, however, must accept, at least in some part, a degree of determinism, be it 1% or 99%, and from that we can understand that to operate on a human scale requires both free and determined behaviour. And so maybe it would pay to understand what this can mean to us, to our daily existence. Firstly, how does free will fit within us as individuals? What do the cognitive science tell us about free will? That's clicking the fingers. You know, it takes less time to do that, to click your fingers, than it does for your neurological system to process the, the act, to see it happen, to hear it, and to block the movements. It's as though your body or mind lacks any way to take control, even of your own movements. As though we might begin to get some inkling as to what it might really mean to be observing a more primal or fundamental existence. Here's the thing, how this works, how, how anything we do works on a biological level, is that to click my fingers, I need to set up all of the neurological pathways and muscle responses, the mechanical movements required. And I sometimes consciously, but mostly subconsciously, organize all of this previously acquired individually separate units of biological programming into this, this click, into that particular action before I release it. And then I release it. I, I disinhibit a cascade of biological actions. OK, but what that means here for our discussion here of free will is that once that has been set in motion, once the cascade has been given the signal, the go ahead or the gates open for it, there's no stopping it. That's something unstoppable like that is said to be a ballistic movement or phenomena. I mean, that was a simple but well-documented example of biological process. So we must see that our choices are constrained in all sorts of ways. We must accept a certain percentage of determinism. So what's left? How do we think we should have free will at all? Jordan Peterson, I know, I come to him quite a lot, says it's useful to think about free will in the same way as we think about games. I love this. There are rules and limitations, circumstances described from which aims and structures, causes and consequences flow. But within that framework of predetermined laws, be they the laws of chess or football, quantum physics, there are an immense, infinitesimal number of possible choices, free choices that emerge as though the act of prescribing limits is akin to opening up a new limitless world of possibility, like with music. And I'd go as far as to say that any creative urge in all its expression is in essence nothing more than a method of defining new boundaries creating a new world. Creativity appears on the face of it, the ultimate expression of free spirit, of rebellion, an embodiment of all it means to have free will, being the artist, the explorer, the outsider, burning the rule book and tearing out the pages. But, and perhaps counterintuitively, the artist is ultimately selecting a new landscape to explore, narrowing its scope with each work so that it might become a consistent whole, Yes, free will to explore, and yes, free will to decide on the possibilities, but within a framework. It's only once the framework has been imposed that its boundaries and meaning can be tested. Ultimately, the limits determining the coherence. Free will is nothing without determinism. There's a usefulness in this thinking about free will as a game in that it allows us to recognise the need for the limits, for some degree of determinism in which our choices can be made. And I think there's an elegance to this duality and in its parallel to the acceptance of wave duality for example the lessons of quantum mechanics and in the way we're beginning to become accustomed to non-binary more nuanced answers in our conversations think otherwise that the question of free will is a simple binary 
all or nothing. If there was no determination and everything was free will, dependent on choice, we would be gods. And even here there is a deep irony, perhaps we are, but you can't get out of the trap. The concept of an all-powerful, unlimited being or state is paradoxical. One irony lies in the attributes of omniscience, omnipotence and omnipresence. Classical attributes of a god. These classical attributes would provide limitless power, limitless knowledge and limit limitless being. So what limits would this god possess? A god must lack nothing. The limits would be its lack. And so now all of a sudden we have a being that's no longer the god we thought. There must be limits. So back to clicking the fingers, it appears we have the free will to decide whether to set up the cascade and when to release it. But once that cascade has been released, that's it. So might there be some form of time constraint to our interaction with free will? Yes, it looks like the further we look into the future, the freer our decision making might become. And once we become closer to the present, the more that freedom becomes constrained to a point where it is diminished, disappears. Peterson, like thinking about how we operate as mechanical beings to thinking about how we learn a musical instrument. Through repetition, we train our body and brains to store mechanical routines, moving fingers, playing notes, chords formed of mechanical programming, so that these routines can be replayed mechanically without thought. The mental effort involved in this learning process is no mean feat and can be neurologically tracked. Starts, load of concentration and attention, load of energy in the front of the right side of the brain, as a load of attention is required to encode the movements and the sounds into packets of memorable data, determined neurological quanta, perhaps, but I'm calling them quags. Then the energy tracks to the left side of the brain, and finally begins to move towards the back, requiring less and less upfront computing power as it goes. A trained musician reads the notes, looking ahead, recalling these quags, brings them forward, organising them as a cascade. Automatic motor sequences, quogs, as they are required. This bottom line is how we do stuff. Perhaps the weirdest thing about this is to realise that it's the same mechanism that we're used to using to drive our cars. I mean, this is a bit of luck, really, because your brain is too slow to process and react to stuff going on right in front of you at 40 miles an hour. You've already mechanically run that over. Instead, you look ahead and your brain tracks the future, it tracks the corners and the braking, the gear changes you might need. And your brain sets up the movements you'll need to make when the time comes and lets them go when they're needed. It reads ahead all of the time, relying on mechanical determinism at the point of contact, at a sort of cognitive event horizon. What this says about free will is that there appear to be different degrees of it available to us from, it seems, the virtually limitless possibilities available in our future. Those decisions will make a around the next corner, to a virtual none, complete lack whatsoever, as to events as they get closer. And the free will involved in taking these actions is replaced by predetermined automation, already a set in motion at the event horizon. There you have the cognitive science, the biology of how stuff actually happens, a combination of biological determinism and a conscious mind able to plan and manipulate. And while consciousness is doing this, Peterson says... It isn't running down like a clock, heading toward a final state of entropy, like a clock runs downhill. Human beings, it feels, don't appear to run down, and that is because we, or life, is not clockwork. There's no, there is no analogy to the clockwork determinism of thermodynamics. Life is different, and that it's created of dissipative systems, taking energy in and releasing it, in balance with our energetic environment, and organising the chaos. We are anti-entropic, dissipative systems, confronting an infinite number of potentials in the chaos and casting them into reality. Really? Seems the second law of thermodynamics says that in a closed system there is a flow of energy, a natural tendency towards disorder. Basically, energy reaching equilibrium across space or time. Life, it is said, however, creates order out of disorder, violates this law. But not so if the system is an open system and the energy available therefore massively outweighs the expected downhill flow towards entropy. With the addition of feedback loops, non-linear equations, equations that are particularly suited to descriptions of natural phenomena such as weather, then dissipative engines like steam engines turning heat into movement create structure. 
uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1977 was given to a, a Russian for contr contributions to non-equilibrium thermodynamics, particularly the theory of dissipative structures, non-equilibrium th thermodynamics, open systems. But what does that mean for us? See a water spout, a cloud, see a galaxy or a star. There's a short video on YouTube that provides a fantastic example of what this means. Chaos and Dissipative Structures by Jochen Rocker. Uh, you'll find a link to that and a transcript on the website. But just consider a two litre water bottle. And just to be sure, can we make this the last two litre plastic water bottle that ever got made in a testament to a period of absolute monkey brained idiocy? But back from the distraction, we have this bottle, three quarters full of water. We turn it upside down and we zoom in and we focus on the water as it flows out. The energies of gravity and the laws of thermodynamics work on this water, dragging it down and out as air comes in to replace it. And at the point of contact, at the moment between the water and the air, with all of the energy of that spin, a vortex forms. This is a structure, a stable, palpable, very real structure. It's neither water, nor air, nor both, nor neither in succinct parallel to Heisenberg's Copenhagen interpretation in 1917. This is something that emerges from the conditions. We can see it at once solid, but also so close to the edge of breaking up, formed out of the chaos, formed out of the drive for entropy. And out of all of that visceral power, we get order, we get structure. Ultimately, we get life out of this. For a physicist's view of biology, given this theory, the biological choice becomes a choice between defining life as either one, a violation of the laws of thermodynamics, or two, as a dissipative structure. So can we find evidence for that? Well, so a cell it transpires can be seen to exist under the right conditions. A cell maintains a high flow of electrons out of its nutrient, surviving within a high redox energy environment. So we look for the engines. And in a search for these engines, we ask what's special about redox energy. Well, it turns out that the conditions for redox energy transfer remain particularly stable in water, meaning that a long, chemically speaking, lifespan is available for structures to appear. And also that organic compounds such as quinones and flavins and molybdenum, these create order out of the chaos, but mostly metals such as iron and nickel, etc. I mean, this is still early research, but yes, there we have our engines. So I love the energy of that dissipative structure, the way that something can get formed of nothing. Maybe it's a it's a way that consciousness can be seen to have emerged out of complexity and also a way that we can see societal structures build out of our organisations. But we need to look at free will from the perspective of conscious choice. It seems that we need less and less free will to survive. But still we need to ask why we would have evolved a consciousness at all without free will. Why would it have emerged? Why would we have evolved with a brain capable of planning and prediction and of reaction? A mind that feels and enjoys creativity and decision-making if there was no use to it. And we can understand this through the lens of evolutionary biology. I'm not sure if I'll ever come to grips with the distinction between the two, between an extended phenotype and a meme, but hopefully it's enough to ask how this newly loaded version of free will fits into our concept of society. Because society, community, politics emerge out of life, the emergence of life give weight to the same evolutionary narrative that can be used to describe the dissipative fun structure. The bee in the hive, the bee from the dam, the trade in the market, the family in the village, all of these entities, these expressions of dissipative structure, moving towards order and at the same time demanding control. Peterson presents what might be considered an evolutionary narrative for the existence of consciousness and hence free will, which is rooted in a deep understanding of our place in this world, this reality and from which flow the mechanisms by which we understand ourselves and govern our treatment of others. This view recognises the value of free will from a personal and sociological level, defining it as a necessary component for essentially existential well-being. Its belief is that without determinism comes a fatalistic lack of responsibility, a lack of foundation for one's life decisions and a bankrupt moral code. He says... If you treat yourself as a free moral agent with choice, able to determine the course of your life and make choices about the world that is going to come into being, then you seem to get along better with yourself and to be less anxious and to be, and to be more productive. 
And if you treat others like that, as free agents making choices about how reality is going to come into being, with appropriate reward and punishment being available for when they get it wrong or right, then your relationships seem to work. And if we set up society in a way that reflects this ability, it seems we can have an effective and functional society. There are rewards, evolutionary rewards, for behaving in this way. This is where the importance of free will can be found, through the metaphor that has human existence as a dissipative structure, akin to a whirlpool in a bottle. The bottle's a universe and we're given form and consciousness directly out of the flow of entropy through it. And we're given, we are driven by evolutionary engines to create order out of chaos. Ever more patterning is created. Patterns of language, of hierarchy, of social organisation and society. Our layered brains, which have evolved to make sense of this whirlpool, experience free will as a mechanism that deals with potential before it is transformed into actuality. What is important, what flows from this, is that free will has an essential part to play in our conception of our moral responsibility and our vested interest through our relationship to society, that social contract, is to believe in free will, to believe we're responsible for our own choices. And that we're capable of decision because without free will, we have a God committing crime, a lack of good or evil. There's no sin. There is no punishment, no need for good. We have a psychopathic slide into social chaos. But why punishment? If we have the right education, well, maybe a more detailed look at the tragedy of the commons next week. For now, thank you for listening. I've been Ant Biggs and this has been Cal the Podcast. Home for us is at cowthepodcast.online. Come take a look, check out the transcripts of the show. You'll find links there for anything I've mentioned. And sign up for updates, maybe comment. All the details you need, you can find there. That's cowthepodcast.online. See you there. See you next week. Mm-hmm.